Do you see any hearsay, first of all, in that statement from the, uh, <laughs> from the homeowner? So many things in that <laughs> statement. So what ended up happening in that case? <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, interestingly enough, uh, do you remember when we were talking about the Hubbard case, I said the state had records of a conviction of the prior burglary? Well, in this case, Mr. Santoyo wasn't even charged in California. I mentioned that in Hubbard that the homeowner came... Judge Gibbons, um, how does the court view the selection of issues that an attorney brings on a, an appeal in a criminal case? Okay. Well, I think John just made a very good explanation of how the way it should be done. We look at it a lot of times and you know, are puzzled by, <laughs> by, by the issues on occasion. But it's up to the, the client and the attorney to decide what they are how they're going to bring them and the court reacts to what's presented to us. So we're, we're reactive. We're not proactive in that situation. Parties frame their issues. That's what we decide. And does the court prefer that an attorney bring up every possible issue that they could conceivably appeal or keep things limited? Well, interestingly enough, the Nevada Supreme Court has said that Counsel are often most effective by not raising every conceivable issue. <laughs> Very important to focus. I'm sure, Amy, you've been through that too. I mean, you, you might have five issues, you might have two, you might have ten. You have to be selective. I mean, first of all, we have page limits on briefs, so that uh, creates its own constraints. However, they can be expanded. But that's, uh, again, we leave it up to the attorneys. And so, Amy, how do you balance having to make sure that you're bringing all of the issues that need to be brought, making sure you don't have an ineffective counsel claim for not bringing certain issues, but not diluting the appeal so much by bringing issues that the court's not going to care about? Um, the same as, as Judge Gibbons just said, knowing that you don't have, first of all, having the confidence to know that you don't have to bring every issue and that you are most effective when you do not. Um, really being familiar with current criminal case law and the, the status of the law and, and making sure that you are, are familiar with current constitutional law and um, knowing, knowing what is going to be most successful, where, where the true errors lie. Um, if you are bringing an appeal based on every single hearsay statement that came in, that is not going to be successful. Um, you're going to be wasting pages on on something that happened. Um, if you have, if you are bringing an appeal based on one single, you know, every single hearsay statement, and then you know one piece of of prosecutorial misconduct in a closing argument, that's not going to to save the day. However, if you have overwhelming prosecutorial misconduct in closing argument, definitely bring that. Know how to bring, you know, um, maybe one. Error alone is not enough, but when you have overwhelming error in the trial, um, that may be something that you know that you need to you need to figure out how to how to bring that into the court in a coherent, cohesive manner that shows that you're not just taking the pot full of spaghetti and throwing it at the wall. What about cumulative error? Well, then that's kind of where I was going with with cumulative error, showing that that there was enough there, but but it needs to be. So you might have a bunch of small errors in a yeah. case, but if you, none of which would suggest a reversal, but if you put it all together, mm -hmm. does it now make a difference and suggest a person didn't get a fair trial? Right. But they need to be such, I would think that, such that, like I said, not every single hearsay exception, but they need to be such that they are errors that would matter together, taken all together, that, that it denied your client a completely, a fair, a fair trial. And um, Judge Gibbons, is there a case that, that deals with some of the, you know, what issues you should bring and, and what we've been discussing right now? Yeah, yeah the, the, it happens all the time. And uh, there is one case I want to mention, even though it's an unpublished uh, decision. Uh, this was Santoyo versus State from two years ago in the Nevada Court of Appeals. And in this particular case, uh, Mr. Santoyo was arrested for trying to rob somebody in a casino and trying to steal somebody's car, you know, miles away. And 
the state brought in, tried to bring in evidence pretrial that Mr. Santoyo had stolen a car in California. And, and the state had two different theories. One is called res geste. So I don't want to get in the weeds here too much with Latin terms, but essentially what that means is you can't talk about the crime for which the person is on trial without also talking about another crime. And in this case, the stolen car was parked in the casino parking lot and Mr. Santoyo had confronted one of the employees and was talking to him about needing a car and he pointed at this stolen car and implied that he had driven that car to the casino. Then he tried to grab the keys away from the employee of the casino. He wasn't successful. And then he ran off. And it turned out later the stolen car was out of gas. So <laughs> about five hours later, Mr. Santoyo was discovered sitting in somebody's car in the residential neighborhood. And the owner came out and saw him sitting in the car and, you know, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm just resting here or something. And, and so the person, the homeowner told him to get out of there and he decided to call the police. So the question is, could the jury hear about this uh, stolen car from Sacramento in the Nevada case? Would that be admissible to explain the crime? Can you, can you explain the charges about the, what happened at the casino and what happened in the driveway without talking about what happened in Sacramento? Well, yes, I mean, you can. So the state had an alternative theory. Well, it's a prior bad act, and we want to show that his intent was to steal the car uh, and steal the uh, keys from the uh, casino worker and then steal the car from the homeowner. You know, that might have been a valid theory, but the judge didn't admit the evidence on that ground. So the judge said it's part of the raised just day. It helps tell the complete story of the crime. But the Nevada statute doesn't say that. So that was an improper ruling by the district court. And so what, what do you do on appeal if you're, if you're defending this, if you're the prosecutor? Well, they offered was perhaps was the correct theory that it showed his intent to steal but the judge didn't admit it for that reason. So the wrong one. And then something else happened. When the homeowner was testifying, he, he, said, he said to the jury, the, the, the district attorney said, well, why did you call the police if this person was just sitting in your car and he didn't actually do anything to your car? And he said, this is in front of the jury, he said, well, I'm taking a criminal justice class and my professor has said that if a person has committed a crime before, they're likely to do it again. And of course, this homeowner didn't even know about the stolen car in Sacramento. I mean, his, that car was at the casino. You know, he was miles away at his house. So there was no objection though from the defense attorney about this statement from the, the homeowner. So now we've got a couple things going on in this case. The judge said the stolen car evidence could come in because it helps tell the whole story of the crime. Uh, it doesn't come in to show intent. And this, the judge sat there mutely as the uh, homeowner made this comment about people's uh, propensity to commit crimes. <laughs> so, so, uh, did you see any hearsay, first of all, in that statement from the, uh, from the homeowner? So many things in that <laughs> statement. So what ended up happening in that case? <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, interestingly enough, uh, do you remember when we were talking about the Hubbard case, I said the state had records of a conviction of the prior burglary? Well, in this case, Mr. Santoyo wasn't even charged in California. I mentioned that in Hubbard that the homeowner came and testified in Nevada, came from Washington State. The car owner did not come to Nevada. So all there was was the sheriff's officer saying, we contacted the police in, in Sacramento and they said it was a stolen car. That was the evidence. So many so, <laughs> layers of problems with that. So anyway, there, there's a, a very uh, detailed rule about admitting evidence of other crimes. And had the right witnesses been there to prove that he had actually stolen this car in California, it probably would have been proper evidence. But that's not what was brought in. And then you have this homeowner statement of people that commit a crime once are likely to do it again, which might sound intuitively correct. but that's not something a jury hears, particularly from a lay witness. So at any rate, uh, the Court of Appeals found uh, in a two-to-one decision that this was an unfair trial, 
And because of that statement, because the jury heard about that stolen car in California, uh, just from the police, not from just a, a hearsay statement, like over a telephone call. And uh, we, re we reversed the conviction, but we also addressed the bad act, and we said that that hadn't been proven. Now, the dissenting judge in our case said, well, there was overwhelming evidence that he intended to uh, steal the keys from the casino worker and to steal the car from the homeowner. Therefore, there shouldn't be a new trial. And uh, as the majority, the, the two judges on our court said, including me, said that no, this was not a fair trial. I mean, at some point, the situation can be so bad, it infects the proceeding, you cannot trust that this person would have been found guilty of all of the charges if the jury had not heard the improper evidence, therefore, he gets a new trial. And do you ever consider issues that were not raised on appeal in an appeal decision? Well, this, this relates to the, the earlier question about the, how the appeal is filed, the attorney and the client choose what the issues are. Uh, the, the appellate court will often see other issues. I mean, we do this every day, so we're very conversant in all the things that can go wrong. I mean, when you're reading this, we, we only see the bad things. That's why there's an appeal. So you see it every day. And so we could come up with all sorts of issues, but that's not the, the role of an appellate court. The appellate court is to, let, is to let the parties frame the issues, the points they're most concerned about. The rule is a person is entitled to a fair trial, but not a perfect trial. So we are not looking for things that could have gone wrong. Now, if it gets brought to us in the form of the cumulative error that, um, that a Amy was briefly describing, you know, then, then you're looking at it a little bit differently. You're trying to get the, what's the big picture of view of this and not just one small event, a 30-second occurrence in a one-week trial. So it, it, it can change, but as a general rule, no. We will go no farther than the exact issues that are raised. And, and, and but don't forget, you get a second bite of the apple if you're a defendant because you can file the post-conviction petition, raise some other issues perhaps, and also challenge your lawyer and why didn't the lawyer raise those issues. Uh, so if, if an attorney doesn't bring up issues in a criminal appeal, those issues could conceivably be brought up by another lawyer who discovers them on a, a post-conviction um, or an ineffective assistance of counsel um, proceeding at another time? Yes, that's, and that's what would happen, and that's the, the purpose of that, is for then you have a, yet another set of, of eyes on the entire case from beginning to end. All right, but do you want me to give you an example where we did raise it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, this particular case was a, uh, was, is called Goad v. State, G-O-A-D. Uh, the decision was a little less than a year ago, and it was an appeal brought by the Washoe County Public Defender's Office, so through, through John or his office. And this was a, a terrible murder case in Reno where a person was charged with stabbing his neighbor 250 times. And these people were friends, they're in an ap apartment complex and they're both retired and they hung out together. You know, that, I mean, on the face, doesn't that just sound very bizarre? And the issue on appeal dealt with competency. Did this person understand the criminal proceedings? Was he able to assist his, his lawyer in the defense? Did he understand the charges? And it didn't come up pretrial where you normally would think somebody's competency would be at issue, but it came up during the trial. And the reason it arose on the third day of the trial is that uh, Mr. Goh did not receive the medication from the jail staff in Reno that he was getting after he was incarcerated. And he started acting strangely in the trial. And so the judge noticed it and the bailiff told the judge there's something going on here that's wrong with Mr. Goad. The judge stopped the proceedings, made some inquiries, found out he had not had his medication, recessed the case for the day, and then sent, sent uh, Mr. Goad back to the jail, get the medication, and we'll resume in the morning. Well, the next morning, uh, the jail staff had, had told the authorities that, yes, he got his medication, he's ready to go. 
but he was still acting in a very bizarre way during the trial. He wouldn't talk to his lawyers, and then he wouldn't even talk to the judge when the judge started asking him questions. He was making hand gestures in response to the judge's question, and it wasn't sign language. It was some attempt to uh, communicate, and the judge proceeded with the trial. And he was found guilty. I mean, it was a very, very strong case. Um, there, there was some video evidence, there was DNA evidence, so it, it wasn't really much of an issue about whether this person committed the crime, at least to the jury it sure wasn't. But the issue on appeal was, should there have been a competency hearing? In other words, if this person didn't understand the proceedings, should the trial go forward? Well, there's, there are many rulings from the U.S. Supreme Court and the Nevada Supreme Court that make it very clear that an incompetent person cannot be in trial. You have to get medication or otherwise help that person before the trial can proceed. And there's a duty upon the trial judge to stop the proceedings if it appears that the person is incompetent and then order a competency evaluation, which typically means two doctors check someone out. Well, that didn't happen in this case. And so on appeal, the, the uh, Washoe County Public Defender's Office said he was denied his right to a competency hearing. This case was set for an oral argument at the, our court's discretion. And during the oral argument, a question came up about, well, can you have a competency hearing after the trial, even though you're supposed to have it during the trial? And I asked that specific question, even though none of the lawyers had argued that point in their briefs. So I caught them by surprise. You know, how would you like that if you were the <laughs> appellate uh, attorney at that moment? <laughs> but both sides were asked the question and got, got to answer it. And the reason I asked the question is because we had already done a lot of research and discovered that there were a number of federal courts and the California Supreme Court had ruled that yes, you can have a competency hearing after a trial, and if it's feasible. Uh, the Nevada Supreme Court had ruled that if a person did not get a competency hearing, he has to get a new trial. And the Court of Appeals looked at it and said, yeah, we understand that, that makes a lot of sense, but why did these other courts say you can do it after the trial? So upon further research, um, we thought that that was a viable outcome of this case and gave the attorneys a chance to answer a question on an issue that was outside of the scope they raised. <laughs> so at any rate, the appellate attorneys were asked the question, do you think it's possible in this case to have a competency hearing instead of a new trial? And can it realistically be determined after the fact? And both the attorneys for both sides, the district attorney and the defense counsel said, it's possible, we don't think it's a good idea, we're not advocating for it, we're not asking for it, no one wanted it, <laughs> but it is possible. And you know, I asked you know, a follow-up question, well, in this case, he was denied his medication. Wouldn't we be able to tell? Couldn't you find out what that medication was and what the effect of it is that he didn't have the medication and he started acting so strangely in the trial? You know, it's, it's pretty hard to say no to that question. So, you know, I was trying to force the answer. <laughs> So that's exactly what happened, and I'm sure John could uh, probably comment on this case too. Uh, yes, um, we decided that uh, the criteria that had been set up by the courts and the federal uh, courts of appeal and the California Supreme Court, the process would probably be workable in this case, but we didn't make the decision ourselves. We said to, to the trial judge, when we sent this case back, said, you have a hearing determine, is it feasible to do a competency hearing? If you say it's not feasible to do it, then our ruling that the person was denied a competency hearing means you have to grant a new trial. However, if you say it is feasible to do a competency hearing, then go ahead and conduct it, follow the Nevada statutes as set by the legislature. There's a process described in the statute about appointing doctors, find out if there's other evidence available, conduct your competency hearing, judge, and then make your decision. Was he competent at trial or was he not? And if he was, the guilty verdict and judgment stands. If he was not competent, then you must grant a new trial. John, do you want to add to that? 
I'll just simply, I'll just simply tell you that um, I, I appreciate the court's uh, direction to the district court to make that determination. Um, I probably would have argued strenuously, let's just get a new trial. But in any event, um, I can tell you this would be out if we if you were if this was a court at the outside of the record. I can tell you that um, our office was uh, uh, relieved because our, our our trial attorney attorneys who represented him would be uh, potential witnesses. Um, and right now the status is is that the district court judge made a determination that a retrospective analysis is possible, but Mr. Gold has been deemed. Um, to be incompetent, and now there's there. The last I checked, they're pursuing further uh, competency evaluations and treatments. So right now, it's sort of in a holding pattern. Okay, so just to sum that up, the trial the trial court said yes, the competency hearing is feasible. We're going to need witnesses, and including his trial lawyers, Mr. Goad's trial lawyers. They were from the public defender's office, so the public defender's office is withdrawn from the case. New lawyer appointed, and then the former counsel for him will be witnesses plus whatever doctors or other medical evidence they get and they haven't had that final hearing yet so it's still up in the air whether um, he will have a new trial or the judgment of conviction will be reinstated. So in Nevada we have um, two different appellate courts. We have the Nevada Supreme Court and we have the Court of Appeals which has been around how long Judge Gibbons? Uh, since 2015 so just over seven years. And how, how is it determined what cases get heard by the Nevada Supreme Court and what cases are heard by the Nevada Court of Appeals? Well, uh, m most people don't know that the Court of Appeals in Nevada is actually what's called, well, I'll say what it's not called. It's not an intermediate appellate court like in California in most states. So when an appeal is filed, it's filed with the Nevada Supreme Court, not with the Court of Appeals. If it was in California, it'd be filed with the Court of Appeals. So Nevada is one of the few states that has what's called a deflective model. Cases go to the Nevada Supreme Court and the Supreme Court transfers cases to the Court of Appeals. So there's only one court clerk's office, appellate court clerk's office, that processes all appeals. You can imagine how much money that saves. I mean, in California, I think they have seven different appellate districts. And so each of them has their own clerk's office and you know, all the costs that goes with it. Nevada has one. And so when it's in the Supreme Court, uh, this, the Chief Justice or the Executive Committee of Justices decides whether to transfer it to the Court of Appeals. And it's not an arbitrary decision. There's a rule, and it's Rule 17, and it lays out what cases the Supreme Court will hear and what cases the Court of Appeals will hear. But it's not an absolute rule except in a couple situations. So if it's a death penalty case, it must stay in the Nevada Supreme Court. So our court has never seen a death penalty case and never will. Uh, there are certain other types of cases that are in, that are in uh, civil area like water law, tax law, those cases stay in the Supreme Court. The cases that are presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeals though are ones that you know, dear to dear, your heart, the family law appeals. <laughs> so. The Supreme Court can retain the family law case if it wants to, but presumptively it would go to the Court of Appeals. So there are a number of cases that fall into that category. And the idea is to try to equalize the caseload too. So roughly one third of the cases filed would go to the Court of Appeals. We have three judges. The, Court of, the Supreme Court has seven justices and they can work in panels of three or they can have all seven together. So you divide up the, the cases, look at the workload. Um, our cases are typically less serious than the ones that are in the Supreme Court. I, mean, I just described the Goad case. I mean, he was convicted of murder, sentenced to life without parole, so obviously a very serious case. But nonetheless, that case could go to us because it wasn't a death penalty case. So that's, uh, that's basically how it works. I mean, there's a lot more detail and nuance to it, but in the broad sense, that, that's the process. And, and Amy, how do you tell the Supreme Court in an appeal um, what type of case it is for the purpose of them determining if it should get pushed down to the Court of Appeals or stay in the Nevada Supreme Court? How does that work procedurally? 
So NRCP, or I'm sorry, NRAP, I should say, excuse me, um, is uh, there's a routing statement that gets filed with, um, with the appeals, and we look at NRAP 17 for the case assignment rule that we use with the routing statement to say whether it's um, a case that is presumptively retained by the Court of Appeals or something that is, um, is to stay with the Supreme Court. Um, so that's, that's what we use. And don't you get to have some input in that we decision? We do, yes. <laughs> um, we, can, we can ask if it's something that um, we want to stay with the Supreme Court and if there are reasons for that, if there is an issue of, um, uh, if it's a, an issue for suppression, um, constitutional issue, if it's a public policy issue, if there's something that we feel that it should stay with the Supreme Court um, for a specific reason, then we can put that in our statement and ask that it remain there. Does the court always do what is in your routing statement? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, John, do, do you fill out those routing statements too? Oh, absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll say this about Rule 17. Uh, Judge Gibbons mentioned it, and that is, Rule 17 has certain presumptions with regards to case assignment, but ultimately it's the Supreme Court that gets to decide which case is going to go where. And so a case that might look like it's presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeal may be kept by the, by the Supreme Court. And I have, I have at least one case that not only, it was a sentencing appeal, and not only was uh, it kept by the Supreme Court, even though it's presumptively assigned to the Court of Appeal, it was decided by the en banc court or the full, court, the full seven member court, not a panel. So the Supreme Court has some discretion to do that. With regards to writing statements, Amy's absolutely right. You put in, you put in the writing statement, um, your reasons why you think it might be proper to stay in the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court or why you think it should go to the Supreme Court for decision. But whatever the court decides, whether it keeps it or trans transfers it, um, you don't get to uh, you don't get to appeal that decision. It's a final decision. And then again, um, on another issue of um, you know things that are left to the court to decide, uh, some cases go to oral argument and some don't. How does the court decide which cases they're going to hear on oral argument? Are you referring to the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals or both? Um, I guess your knowledge. <laughs> so the Court of Appeals. <laughs> How do you decide? <laughs> well, the, it, in that routing statement or the notice of appeal somewhere, counsel has the option to ask for oral argument. So, I mean, you can slip it in there if you think the case should be set for oral argument. Since the Supreme Court has typically the more serious cases, they're more likely to set a case for oral, oral argument because that's one of the criteria. I mean, how serious is the case? You look at the result, how big are the issues? Do they affect people beyond the ones just in that appeal? In other words, do they affect the whole state or just two people? So that's, a, that's very important. If it's, if it's more likely to affect a larger group of people, it's more likely to get argument. And, but we focus in our court primarily on whether it's an unclear area of the law. Can the attorneys explain something to us that we might be missing or could help us interpret a statute or another case or a cases uh, from a federal court outside of Nevada? Uh, that, uh, that's usually really helpful. So we want to know, can the lawyers present something that will actually lead to a better result in the case? And typically, the lawyers offer something. I mean, there's rarely an oral argument where we don't hear something important. So it, it's a, a very good process. Now, we have the other type of argument that's almost mandatory. And you know this one very well, Emily. That's the pro bono case. So if a lawyer takes a case on to represent somebody for free, then we say, and so does the Supreme Court, then you deserve an oral argument. I mean, you're gonna spend all that time and effort on it, then we wanna make sure it's given every possible consideration. So those cases are automatically set for oral argument. Uh, it seems like uh, more than half of those are family law cases, maybe even two thirds of them. Although we have an oral argument set at the end of this month and it's on a 
that's not a pro bono case, it's on a medical malpractice where somebody had their leg amputated. So serious case, obviously. <laughs> And there are some unclear areas of the law that we think the uh, council can help us with. So that's how that one got um, set for argument. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I misspoke. That is, that is a pro bono case. So that's one of the exceptions where it wasn't a family law case. But nonetheless, I, I would stand by what we said. That is a really good case to have argument on anyway. That's probably why pro bono council got appointed. I think there's probably some yeah. overlap when yeah. when the um, Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court decides that a case needs to be appointed counsel, and when they decide that they need to have oral arguments, there's probably a lot of overlap in the cases that would get both of those decisions, I would guess. Yeah, yeah I, you know, that's a good summary there. Um, do oral arguments have a significant impact on the decision? Yeah, well, I'd be interested to hear hear the answer to that from counsel too, mm -hmm. because and, you know you do these cases, and do you think it makes a difference? I mean, we walk in the door already fully prepared, and if you're in a jury trial, the judge tells the jury every single day at every break, do not form any opinions, do not express any opinions. Wait till you've heard all the evidence before you make any decisions. You meet in the jury room, discuss it with each other. Don't do it ahead of time. You can't do that. It's really hard to follow that rule for a juror and imagine for the court too. And we've already read these briefs. We looked at these cases from around the state or around the country. Uh, you have a pretty good idea where the case is going when you step in the door for oral argument. But nonetheless, counsel a lot of times will know the case better than the judges and you can bring up something that we didn't understand or didn't realize the impact of it and that can change it. You know, it, it certainly is possible. So you have to walk in the door as an appellate attorney knowing that what you say today is so important the outcome is dependent upon it. You can't take it the other way around that the court's already decided and what you say is meaningless. That's definitely the wrong approach. And then we also have um, some cases that come out um, are um, an unpublished order and some of them are published decisions. Um, and first, I guess, what is the difference? What is a published decision versus an unpublished order? Yeah, that, that terminology has been around for a long time. It, it seems a little out of place now because everybody can look at everything online. <laughs> so everything's filed with the clerk, so it's publicly filed. It's published online. It's on the Supreme Court website. The Court of Appeals decisions are all there. So uh, at, taking the misnomer aside, it's the effect on lawyers and other judges. A published opinion means an opinion is a decision where it says opinion on it, and it's not just somebody's opinion. It means it's a statement of the law from, the, from that court that all the other lower courts in this state are bound by. So it's extremely important. So for example, in the Goad case, that's a published opinion. So that came up with a new, a new statement of law, a retrospective competency hearing. Don't have that in Nevada, now we do. So that's why that's published. The Santoyo case about this, the car, the stolen car, and whether certain evidence should have been admitted, that was relatively routine. So it didn't require a published opinion because it was a restatement of existing law. So that's primarily what, uh, what we're looking for. As I mentioned, with the Supreme Court having the more serious cases, they're going to do a lot more published opinions than the Court of Appeals will. And incidentally, uh, if anybody recalls, uh, Amy mentioned the NRAP, that's the Nevada Rules of Appellate Procedure. Those rules were amended in, in 2015. It went into effect in 2016 and said all, all decisions of the Nevada Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals could be considered as some form of precedence or persuasive value. Well, that rule was changed in 2017 and the Court of Appeals was removed from it. I'm on the Rules Committee and, and this uh, particular issue is being studied and it looks like, uh, based upon what's coming out of that study, that this rule might change again and everything is citable. 
So I, I'm sure as a practitioner, you know, Amy, you, and John, I mean, you, you find decisions that are called unpublished, but they address all the issues and the law, and they're probably almost as good as the published opinions, but you, if it's from the Court of Appeals, you can't cite it right now. So that's a little frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it happened to me just a few weeks ago on an appeal I'm working on, so it would be wonderful if that were changed. If, I'm, <clears throat> if I might add, you know, one of the reasons why the rule, and I agree with Judge Gibbons, I think the rule is, is going to be changed to make these, these decisions, these unpublished decisions, uh, citable, at least as uh, to the extent that they're persuasive, is because they're readily available. Everything can be uh, found on a database, an electronic database. Prior to um, that advancement, when, when published opinions or, and unpublished orders were simply mailed to counsel um, and the published decisions were mailed to law libraries and to courts and to DAs and public defenders, those unpublished orders were not readily available to people. And so I think, I think the thinking was that it would be fundamentally unfair that somebody might have access to an order that somebody else on the other side didn't have access to. And that might result in a, in a unfair playing field with regards to the appellate issue. But now that everything is available by electronic database, and when you cite an unpublished order, you have to identify that database where it can be found so that your opposing side has access it just makes it fundamentally fair. And it makes great sense because even though, even though a, a, an order may be unpublished, there may be some great language. And I, I can think of several where the unpublished order has some great language that was very useful for an appeal that I was writing. Um, so I'm thankful that they're available and can be used that way. And wrapping up, um, Judge Gibbons, what's the most important thing to remember when preparing and submitting a criminal appeal? Well, we've, we've had a pretty good discussion here today on, on how to go about doing that, and I would strongly reiterate that you have to make the record below. Make the objection, have the court reporter or court reporter write it down, court recorder, have it in written form, get an order from the judge, that preserves it for appeal. But believe it or not, even when people do that, sometimes they don't transmit those documents to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. And we've used the word a lot today about making the record. Well, what is the record? The record is what documents are in front of the appellate court. It's not what might have been said to the trial judge or the jury. It's what is on paper in front of the appellate court. So if it's not in front of us, it's not in the record. So you have to not only make your objections and arguments below, but you now have to transmit those to the appellate court. And it's just shocking the number of times that we don't have what we actually need. And you'll, uh, there's, there are some few rare exceptions where we can order things, but it's far from routine. So it's the appellate attorney's duty or even the trial lawyer's duty to make sure that the proper records get sent to the appellate court. If you have, uh, are writing the brief, like, you know, John was describing this earlier, I mean, I would suggest argue your most significant issue first. I mean, the court's attention is there. You know, John was talking about, you don't necessarily just go, here's witness one, here's witness two. I mean, you, you have to develop it so you can argue your best issue right off the bat and grab the court's attention and say, wow, there is, if you're the appellant, there's really something wrong with this trial. I mean, the appellate courts, we, we know you have a tendency to affirm uh, because of the standard of review that we're not talking about, but at any rate, that's, you've got to do something that will grab the court's attention and force them to say, you know, this, this is really significant. So I would say make your best argument first and not necessarily in chronological order. You go take the top issue. And if you can't cite any authority for your arguments, for your other arguments, I would say don't even make them. I mean, there's, there's a, a rule that says if it's not cogently argued or supported by authority, the appellate court doesn't have to consider it. Now, once in a while, you'll have something novel, and there is no authority for it, and you still make that argument. But if you're just going to throw something out there and don't support it with anything, you're just wasting time and space. Better, better to develop your, your uh, more meaty arguments. 
And my final point is, is also a takeoff on what uh, John was saying. And I, I tell this to my law clerks. I tell this to everybody I talk to. Tell the story. There are so many cases. Why does this affect you? How is your, why is your client the real person that an injustice was committed against? We need to know that there's something wrong with this if, this, if you're the appellant's lawyer that deserves a very close look and possibly a new trial or even more might just outright win. So tell the story at the beginning, in the middle, at the end. Do that in the trial court too, but uh, also do it in the appellate court. And of course, if you're on the other side of the case, the respondent, which criminal defendants are rarely in that position, but it applies there too. Uh, Tell it why, from your perspective, that was a fair trial. So I would just, from this whole session here today, I just remember those, those couple words, tell the story. Thank you.